I'd, I'd like to say good morning, everyone, and welcome to Antry Races in Liverpool. Last year, we were in my hometown of Birmingham, and my sad football team of Birmingham City Football Club. Um, so we're on a we're on a more happier times, I think, being in Liverpool. <laughs> so, so I would like to say um, thank you for coming to Think Local, that personal roadshow. And uh, this year's theme is personalisation in health and care, the next stage. I'd just like to give you a bit about Think Local at Personal. Think Local at Personal has grown in influence and so has our uh, family group, and I call family group, the National Co-Production Advisory Group. It is like a, a, a family and as a group we have expanded and one of our remits is to make sure some seldomly heard voices are heard in places where voices have historically not been heard. A few examples uh, of our work for, with uh, the National Co-Production Advisory Group uh, are the work around uh, Joint Improvement Winterbourne View, which was on uh, the telly this morning, if anyone see, saw the news. Um, also, uh, involvement in the Care Bill guidance development work. Also, uh, our involvement in commissioning for better outcomes and uh, no assumptions narrative for personalised, coordinated care and support in mental health. Just to name a few things that uh, our members have been involved in. Okay. Um, I started last year by showing people who attended Bir Birmingham Think Local at Personal Conference a slide of a train. Some of you are thinking, he's really lost the plot now. He's showing images of, of, of trains. But it's uh, because of my pattern of dyslexia, it helps me use images to convey a message. But I think um, the Think Local at Personal uh, a train or vehicle which supports organisations to enable choice and control within the context of personalisation. And the passengers, you here today, are on a journey with, with all other people here and partners. To, and we also need to remember those people who use services and carers and also self-funders who are not in this room as well as those making it real, organisations and many other organisations that are not in this room. Okay. Um, um, before I, 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 I start, uh, I would like to leave, uh, use a quote from um, figures that are from ADAS on this winter, and it's, uh, it states, one in three people rely rely on or have close family members who rely on the care system. Some 1.6 million people work in social care and, has a, a, and as a sector prepares for the implementation of the Care Act in 2015, local authorities are bracing themselves for a reduction in government grants. Social care has never been more relevant or challenged there are many obstacles on the way to uh, personalisation. And sometimes, if we welcome those big, sticky and complicated issues, in them are our most powerful opportunities if we all work together in true co-production. We can create those opportunities. Now, today you could say that Think Local at Personal is in the train station using my metaphor. Uh, thanks. thanks for coming, Bill. Uh, the, the event today is a short stop to take some time to think about what we have done and to listen to, the, to those conversations and to network with other people. It is an opportunity to have honest dialogue about what we can improve and the, about personalised and community-based support for people. But also, we know that times are tough and many people struggle to get the dignity and respect they deserve. However, Think Local at Personal Conference 
provides us with many opportunities to make people's lives better, personalised and community-based support and keeping it real. The key message I'd, I'd like you to remember throughout the day is, so let's not forget in our rush to get the architecture of health and social care right, let's not lose the focus on people, people who use services and carers, on the hows of successful personalisation. It is the glue for a common uh, culture, language and priorities that will really shape our ability to change the lives for better. Have a great day and keep it real. Can I now hand over back to Marjorie? Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. And I'd just like to add a, a, a few very short uh, bits to that. And to, to, I don't need to remind everyone that uh, just now we're facing um, an uncertain future because local authority, with an election coming up, local authorities have no idea quite what cuts they're going to have to make. And I would just urge all local authorities uh, to think about people who are receiving direct payments uh, to keep choice and control at the centre of things in a time when uh, there may be big cuts. Um, I, I can imagine some local authority saying to somebody who receives a direct payment, uh, you, you, we have to save 10% off your budget, what would you like us to cut? And I think this is a, a really grim task, but if we keep people at the centre, then that shouldn't happen. Um, <clears throat> and as this is the home of the Grand National, on a lighter note, we've decided, TLAP has decided, that we're going to offer a prize to the person who makes uh, the speech mentioning the most fences around this very famous uh, racetrack. And, uh, and, and the prize, uh, I, don't, I think I'll just share it with you now, the prize is uh, a kiss from Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> So, in, in the meantime, this, this conference, which I hope you'll enjoy, um, <clears throat> it, 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 we've got hashtag TLAP14Live. You can follow it live. We've also got um, live reporting via Twitter. And we've got Clinton, the photographer, going around taking photographs, and he says... Uh, if anybody does not want their photograph taken, just to, to give him a sign and he'll pass on. So otherwise, expect to be photographed and look your best. <laughs> now afterwards, after this, um, we're, we're going to have, there are three breakout rooms. Um, so we've got the, the Sunlock, the Papillion and the Corbier. And the Papillion and the Corbier are on floor three above, and the, the, um, the, other one, the, the lower saddle room is on level two, and that's the bar. And uh, food is in the Golden Miller suite back there, and I hope everybody's got everything they, they'd like. I'd now like to hand over to uh, the TLAP director, Sam Bennett. Thank you. Morning, folks. I'd really like to add my, my welcome to that you've had so warmly from Clinton and Marjorie um, there. So welcome uh, to, to Liverpool. I remember very clearly after last year's conference in Birmingham in the sort of warm glow that one has after, uh, after that, that day, which was a good one, um, saying to the team, uh, this year Birmingham City, City, next year Real Madrid. So we, we didn't quite manage that, but I think entry is not half bad. Um, one thing you can definitely say is there's a bar in every room which can't be, can't be a bad thing, so hopefully that will, that will keep us going through. Um, I wanted to say a few short words then uh, about TLAP in 2014, um, about our priorities this year and moving into next, um, and uh, how I hope you'll see those reflected 
uh, in both the content and the tone uh, of today's um, conference. Um, before that, I wanted to reflect just uh, briefly again on uh, one key event for TLAP uh, during 2014, um, and that's looking back to our relaunch, which was in uh, June uh, of this year. Um, and that really provides the platform for our work uh, with you and our partners moving forward uh, for the next um, three years. So as well as cunningly setting the time frame for the agreement as 2017, and thereby in one fell uh, swoop, uh, ensuring our sustainability beyond the next election. Uh, well, you can hope, can't you? Um, it, it does three key things, I think, in particular. One of those, and you've got copies of this in, in all of your uh, delegate bags, and I think there's plenty in the other room as well, um, so, so do have a, a look at that. One of the things it does, um, which I think is important, is it reframes um, and positions uh, what TLAP means um, by personalization um, to reflect the changes in the landscape that we've had since um, 2010. Um, so the goals very much remain the same, um, but the environment is very different. We've made some great progress on some things, um, but I think it's fair to say that progress hasn't been evenly felt um, both by different groups of people and in different parts um, of the country. Uh, and clearly uh, new challenges have also presented themselves within that time. Um, so it refocuses our priorities around building community capacity. That's been part of the vision for personalization um, since the beginning, but perhaps it's uh, part of it that hasn't been um, as well advanced as, as others. So it refocuses around that. It recognizes and, and uh, states the intent that we will grab the opportunity um, to drive forward personalization in the NHS. Um, there has never been more interest in person-centered care in the NHS and the opportunities for that um, than there is right now, and we intend to, uh, to help and support that um, to be successful. Um, it also moves us away from counting widgets, I think. Uh, we need to really move on now, uh, not to just looking at the numbers, the number of people out there um, that are uh, receiving their care and support through personal budgets or personal health budgets, um, but actually looking at how we ensure that their experience of that um, is as good as it can be, um, regardless of the needs that you have or where you live. The second thing our agreement did, um, which is important, is it helped to broaden our scope. So we were delighted to welcome on board uh, a number of new partners. We now stand at um, 51 national organizations or associations um, together. Um, and importantly amongst that, we have uh, NHS England, uh, Public Health England, Office for Disability Issues at the um, uh, DWP, um, NICE, and a number of umbrella associations representing the housing sector. Um, so really, I hope, um, a broader base from which to move forward from uh, for the future. The third and final thing I think that's important about the new agreement uh, looking ahead is it strengthens uh, TLAP as a social movement. Um, this time around, we asked each of our partners to make some specific commitments for how they would support us to deliver on this agreement, and we'll be renewing those on an annual basis. Uh, we'll be renewing and reviewing those, uh, and NCAG, our National Co-Production Advisory Group, will have the key role in that. Um, so members of our group, many of whom are here, um, supporting us to co-produce this conference um, today, as well as uh, chairing, as you've seen, uh, we'll be holding our partners to account for delivering on those um, commitments as we review them. So looking ahead then to um, our priorities and, and uh, how you'll see them reflected uh, in today's conference. Um, for TLAP, as for many across the sector, uh, a huge priority for us this year and looking into the next is, um, is the CARE Act. Uh, we've been uh, instrumental uh, in supporting the development of the statutory guidance around the CARE Act during 2014, and we're now very firmly focused on looking ahead uh, to supporting its successful implementation along with uh, many of our partners, Sky, Skills for Care, um, and, uh, and others. Um, so you'll hear plenty uh, about the CARE Act during the course of the day. Um, you won't hear a great deal about the CARE Act in terms of its technical or logistical challenges, um, I would add. You may not hear a lot today um, about the cap on care costs. You may not hear a lot about deferred payment agreements, uh, informatics, or the system pressure that may or may not result from increased demand for um, assessments. Well, is isn't because that isn't critically important, because of course um, it is. Um, what you will hear from us, however, uh, is about the more important goals that we're striving to ensure uh, are brought to life through the Act, uh, reframing the purpose of our care and support system around the promotion of individual well-being, embedding community capacity building and delivery of the new prevention duty, uh, and enshrining the principles of personalization in statute um, for the first time. So expect to hear uh, plenty about that, uh, about our work on information and advice, on market shaping and commissioning, uh, on improving the delivery of personal budgets and direct payments. Um, secondly, uh, you'll hear plenty about integration uh, at today's uh, TLAP um, conference. It seems uh, sometimes at the moment as if integration is the only 
game in town uh, in the lead-up to the election. Uh, parties are, are seemingly vying to ensure um, that they're pushing ahead further than, um, than others um, with this. So you'll hear plenty about it. Um, what you won't hear too much about uh, is about the structural uh, challenges uh, involved uh, in integration, about information government, governance, I'm, I'm pleased to, um, to add. And you won't hear a huge amount necessarily um, about the, the BCF, uh, the Better Care Fund. That's partly because I've learnt that not talking about the Better Care Fund is a good way to make friends. I was at, I was at an event uh, in one of the regions not too long ago uh, and I think it must have been close up against some deadlines for um, the BCF uh, and it felt very much at that time as if uh, the BCF had acquired uh, a sort of Voldemort quality because uh, it was referred to there as the thing that shall not be named. So you may not hear much about that. Again, that isn't because it's not critically important because of course it is. Um, you'll hear more about our preoccupation with ensuring that integration stays focused on the outcomes and experience of people with health and care needs, um, that attempts to address fragmentation in service delivery come hand in hand with support for self-management and individual empowerment, and that all of these forms are implemented uh, in partnership with people and communities. So you'll hear plenty today about the work we've done uh, with uh, to strengthen the practical application of making it real, uh, our narrative person-centred coordinated care, um, about our work in partnership with the new coalition for collaborative care uh, to bring personalisation to 15 million people with long-term conditions and about our work in partnership with NHS England, ADAS and the LGA to support integrated personal commissioning. Finally, and we've heard this mentioned already, um, the severe and sustained pressure on budgets um, and the sustainability of the health and care system for many millions of people who rely on it is rightly and unavoidably a priority um, for us all. So you will hear about this, but I hope you'll hear about it in the context of the opportunity that we believe still exists to really do things differently, to transform the way the system works for people now and in the future. So you'll hear about it, but I hope you'll hear about um, also um, the... Uh, the way that we can do that uh, together, uh, building on the strengths that I think TLAP brings um, to bear, uh, the importance of genuine partnerships, our passionate belief in the potential for a different conversation through co-production, and our commitment to ensuring a strong vision for improved health and well-being, enhanced citizenship, and support for independent living endures even in the most difficult of times. So I really do hope you enjoy um, the conference. Uh, our next two speakers, I think, are going to be making some time for questions at the end of what they have to say, um, but that's it from me for now, so thank you. Now I'd like to welcome our, uh, D the, David Pearson, the, who's the uh, president of ADAS and the, the chair of the, the TLAP programme board, joint chair. Hello, thank you very much. Oh, I've got a clap there. That's, 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 uh, thank, thank you, thank you. Do feel, do feel free. Um, uh, I'm delighted uh, to be here to uh, represent ADAS, but also as chair of the at the TDAP board, and obviously I shall do my very best to respond to Marjorie's uh, challenge to mention the fences uh, um, at, uh, at Aintree. Um, so my first point is to say thank you very much to the chair, sir. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, learning the lessons from, and from catching up with you to hear about your thoughts and what has been achieved and what we need to do together in the future. And I think my comments are that never has the point been better made by Clinton and Marjorie and Sam that we are definitely stronger together than we are differently. This future cannot be built by one organisation or one set of organisation or one set of interest. It has to be built uh, by all of us. And I'd like to cover three things in the next 20 minutes. Some of the key issues this year um, some reflections on what progress on personalisation has been made in this country. And given the CARE Act and its key, key principles, what might the world of health and social care look like by 2020 uh, from the booth, booth of being the president of, of ADAS? You've got to wake up a bit. Um, <laughs> The priorities for ADAS this year reflect the size of the agenda for social care, a real Beecher's Brook. Um, and I will cover just some of the main themes. The priorities, though, for ADAS are the CARE Act, integration with health 
and other public services, financial sustainability, making get safeguarding personal, changes to the commissioning and placement arrangements following Winterbourne View, and sector-led improvement. And of course, during the year, the issues of deprivation of liberty safeguards, the process of ensuring arrangements are appropriate for people who do not have capacity to decide for themselves, and delayed transfers of care from hospital have become specific issues which require priority attention. Turning to the CARE Act, the final regulations and guidance for the CARE Act changes from next April were published in October, representing a canal turn in social care. Credit is due to the Minister, Norman Lamb, and colleagues in the Department of Health for the collaborative way in which they have engaged with the sector. The strength of this approach has been exemplified by the joint programme between the Department of Health, Local Government Association, and ADAS. But more importantly, the strength of the approach has been exemplified by the contribution of organisations representing providers, users, and carers which has made a qualitative difference to the content of the Act. This is the most important piece of legislation for the care and support of adults for 60 years. There is widespread support for its main principles of well-being, personalised approaches and integrating health care and other organisations. For 15-16, from this point on, the balance shifts towards local implementation and working closely amongst the partners to take advantage of those huge opportunities. There's been the recent provision of an extra £4 million for workforce and bespoke support to local areas, reflecting the issues that have arisen in two local authority stock takes. But in the most recent stock take, 97% of councils were very or fairly confident that they will be able to deliver the Care Act reforms from April 2015. And of course, one of the main concerns is whether there is sufficient money to cover the cost of the new responsibilities. It is very difficult to extract this debate about money for the Care Act from the impact of the overall reductions in local government finance. In preparation for the 2015 changes, 120 authorities returned a survey at the end of August on projected costs for 15-16. This suggested that the funding for carers' assessments and services needed to increase, whilst further analysis indicated that it was reasonable to make some adjustments to the funding in other areas. So, for example, deferred payments uh, for people who come into care and have to pay towards the cost from their house, and indeed early assessments for the 16-17 changes, which include far more people getting state support for their care costs. Of course, the level of demand for new services is difficult to assess. It's a judgment. It's a balance of risk. But we think this is reasonable. So the good news about that is that the survey results have been taken seriously by government and led to an increase in the funding for carers. The National Audit Office, in their excellent report on social care in England, published in March, reminded us, reminded us of the value of informal caring, both in practical and financial terms. A £55 billion contribution to the care and support of people in this country. And the recent report by Carers UK, called Carers at Breaking Point, which I recommend, emphasises the pressure that informal carers can be under including that one in five of those surveyed had given up jobs to care. Allied to new responsibilities for carers' services, councils will need to work with health, other public services, employers and the wider voluntary sector to galvanise support to carers. And I think one of the key turns of the Care Act is actually ensuring that there should be personalised and appropriate services to carers. So the government's analysis identifies that an additional allocation of 35 million in Year 1 
translates into 90 million after five years. That's extra on top of what was envisaged. This is a positive outcome, not just because it reduces the final financial risk for local government, because supporting carers of all ages makes a huge difference to the quality of life of carers and service users. There is still much work to be done on the costs and implications of 2016-17, with the introduction of new financial thresholds and a setting of the, uh, the care cap on costs. I believe, though, overall, that the Care Act is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create a care system that truly reflects the changing balance of need in the population. It is important that we find the capacity to manage present challenges and to lift our heads to create the platform for the future. And today is just one of those opportunities. Of course, as part of this, we need to ensure that there is sufficient funding to not only fund the Care Act, but to achieve its overall aspirations. Spreading a small amount of money even more thinly is not social justice for people who use care services. I want now to turn to Commissioning for Better Outcomes, which will have a focus at today's event. A key section of the Care Act is clear responsibilities for local authority commissioning. The standards for commissioning for better outcomes were launched a few weeks ago at the NCAS conference. We will need to ensure that commissioning reflects the needs for a diverse, sustainable and improving market, and one in which the terms and conditions of staff are compatible with high quality of care. Of course, personalised approaches require the involvement, indeed the control of service users throughout the process, and an ambition to ensure that the market reflects user and carer choices, albeit at a cost that the public purse can afford. The CQC report, published in October, highlights how far we have to go with the level of turnover of nursing staff in care homes at 32% and care staff at 25%. We need care to be a clear career choice if we are to improve the quality of care in this country. I've already mentioned, mentioned finance and I want to touch upon it briefly. The need to save money is balanced with the need to make sure that service provision is at least of an acceptable quantity and quality and that goes to the heart of Marjorie's opening remarks on this topic. Local authorities have a responsibility to balance the books, and you can see the kinds of things that local authorities have t attempted to do by reading John Bolton's report for the Local Government Association on adult social care efficiency. This work highlights the creativity and innovation that has taken place up and down the country in using every principled method of saving money and the way in which users and carers have been involved in many of these innovative approaches. So it provides evidence of the transforming the model of service delivery in places like Shropshire, advice, information, initial response in Calderdale, increased use of telecare in Hampshire, and reducing admissions to care homes in South Tyneside and Tameside, to name just a few examples. But it was the National Audit Office who highlighted the extents of the challenge now and in the future. The report concluded that people are living longer and with some long-term and complex health conditions that require managing through care. Need for care is rising while public spending is falling and there is an unmet need. There is no avoiding this important issue. They raised the question as to whether we are reaching the end of our capacity to absorb the pressures and our own ADAS budget survey published in July showed that 26% savings, 3.5 billion, had been required over four years, 12% cash reductions, and 14% due to increasing need. Directors report a range of concerns, including that pe some people who need services may not be able to access them, and that the quality of life and care may deteriorate if this continues. So we came to the conclusion that in the future, this situation is unsustainable. 
any savings will be outstripped by the doubling of the over 85s in the next two decades and the increasing number of working age adults who will need care. This includes the number of adults with learning disabilities needing care, which, which will increase by 25% between now and 2026. The Barker Commission is very persuasive too in identifying the fact that integration is absolutely the right thing to do, as Sam points out, but that any greater levels of cost effectiveness which may result cannot meet the growing need that will be experienced in the future. We're privileged to hear Giles speak later, but in the NHS five-year forward view launched a few weeks ago, a £30 billion pound gap for the health service was reviewed. It is increasingly accepted as a problem that requires a mix of measures to resolve. We have published our paper on funding adult social care with the Local Government Association. This highlights that the equivalent gap by the end of the decade in social care is £4.3 billion, or 29% of the current budget. It, also, it is also notable that the NHS forward view calls for sustainable social care services. As we approach the general election, and we've got a session on this later, the fo focus on social care is rising with increasing public awareness. The Alzheimer's Disease Society has reported that 21 million people in this country are in touch with people with dementia. And the recent UCAV poll has already been quoted by Clinton, commissioned by the Care and Support Alliance of over 4,500 people. It indicated that one in three people rely on or have a close family member that relies on the care system. Also, after the NHS, social care support is the biggest priority where the electorate want the government to increase expenditure. We must absolutely focus on the opportunities that are afforded by our times. But we must also continue both to share and advocate for the best and most cost-effective ways to deliver a good social care system, balanced with sufficient investment for a sustainable service. In terms of integration, the last six months have involved significant work to join up health care and other services. If I can mention that word, the Better Care Fund, it is widely supported. It has to be right that we try to join up services around, that, around the need to shift the balance of care to prevent many people from spending time in hospital if that is not necessary. But bringing forward 3% of health and care expenditure probably isn't enough to deal with the challenges that we face in the future, nor to genuinely join up care. It's also true that to integrate we need to invest in changing cultures and transforming approaches. And this is as great a priority as pooling money and building structures. But I believe that one of the most significant initiatives, initiatives in the longer term may be, prove to be the joint prospectus launched in September between NHS England, ADAS, Think Local App Personal and the LGA in relation to integrated personal commissioning with the intention of joining up personal health and care budgets. Simon Stephen talked about north of five million people being on a personal budget in time. He went on to say, we need to stop treating people as a collection of health problems and treatments. We need to treat them as individuals whose needs and preferences should be seen in the round and whose choices shape services, not the other way around. This could be a Valentine's Brook between health and social care. Before I move on to the future, I would like to pay tribute to the partners in challenging exciting times for the sector. Over my time as the presidency, I have had the privilege of working closely with a whole range of organisations, regulators, other public service leadership organisations, partnerships such as Think Local Act Personal, and I've continually met people with different interests and perspectives that are united in the one ambition to be creating care services and approaches that we can all be proud of. <clears throat> so much of what we can achieve locally depends on this collaboration. So turning to personalisation and where we have got to. <clears throat> Section 26 of the Care Act puts firmly into place personal budgets as a legal requirement, building on the progress over the last 13 years. It is worth reflecting 
that direct payments have been offered for community-based services since, since 2001. A long time ago. So the headlines from two surveys I want to touch upon. First of all, an ADAS survey on personalisation. This was completed by 132 councils, 87% of all eligible councils between July and August this year. At the 31st of March 2014, 81% of people, all people who used community-based services were on a personal budget. 24% of people with a personal budget have a direct payment, 37% of younger adults and 15% of older people. Expenditure on management arrangement, managed arrangements is 2.8 billion, representing about 47% of total spending on community-based services. There is, however, a long way to go to get the quality of personalisation high across all regions. The quantitative data shows good progress, except for independent service funds, mental health and sensory impairment. But as expected, the quantitative analysis hides quality and consistency issues. <clears throat> So the proportion of people overall supported by personal budgets continues to vary across the regions. Among the total number of people who have personal budgets, there are differences of proportion across the different groups of service users. The level of individual service funds remains relatively small, representing just 4% of people using community services overall. So the themes range from cultural change, improvement to people's experience of services through workforce and market development to prevention. Turning on to the POET survey, a report based on the personal outcomes evaluation tool which was, has been developed by InControl and Lancaster University over the past 10 years. It's a way of measuring what's working and what's not when it comes to personal budgets. It was originally used in adult social care, but has now been developed for use in health, children's services and education. A version for providers is also in development. More than 4,000 people with personal budgets and their carers were surveyed. <clears throat> More than 80% of people surveyed said that a personal budget had made things a lot better when it came to dignity and support and quality of life. Very good news. And many of those issues were about independence, arranging support, mental health, control over their life, feeling safe, relationships with family and people paid to support them, and friendships and self-esteem. Confirming a lot of what we know about how personal budgets and personalised approaches can be transformative. More than two-thirds of carers also said that as a result of the, per of, of the person they care for having a personal budget, things have got up got better or a lot better for them when it came to remaining well and being able to continue caring as well as quality of life for them and the person being cared for. And in my own authority, Nottinghamshire, we've had a, a joint project with the Alzheimer's Society, which I think has demonstrated how that can work for people with advanced levels of dementia in their carers. So lots of good and interesting things there, but I think there are also some challenges in terms of the qualitative arrangements and some of the systems and pro approaches which people still find sometimes bureaucratic and difficult to navigate. So our work is not done, but it is a platform for the future to enable us to use this as a springboard for further change. The Minister of State for Care and Support, Norman Land, said, we must strive to improve the outcomes people experience as a result of using personal bu budgets, not just focusing on the numbers. We should always be asking, are people getting better lives and support, and is the experience simpler and more flexible? So I want to now turn to my final section, which is on a vision for 2020. And this is really how we need to leapfrog over a Fanuvian fence for a better future. I continue to be struck very powerfully by the National Voices definition of integrated care. My care is planned with people who work together to understand me and my carers. 
put me in control, coordinate and deliver services to achieve my best outcomes. And you will note that the word integration isn't mentioned once in that description of integrated care. And my view is that any future has to be rooted in the experience of people who use or need services, not in terms of the systems or organisations. So what could a good health and care system look like in 2020, which is person-centred, coordinated and enhances independence, choice and control? For the whole population, there is a need for us to take better care of our health and well-being by encouraging patterns of behaviour and investment that will keep us well, active and healthy for as long as possible. So I think this consists of a number of features. First of all, we will have the best advice and information, not just a directory or menu of services. The information will help us to understand and manage our circumstances and conditions, as well as navigate the system as our needs change. The focus will be on what we can do as well as our needs. Secondly, there will be help to manage crisis and recuperation, reablement or re rehabilitation. There are access to housing options that are better suited to our changing needs. There will be earlier diagnosis of support for people with dementia and long-term conditions, with public health initiatives designed to prevent or delay the need for health care and support. The health service is better geared to promoting the health and well-being of people with long-term conditions, reducing the current inequalities between those who have a learning disability or mental health problem and the rest of the population. Thirdly, there would be joint assessments for the longer-term needs across health and care with consideration of housing and community facilities. There will be simple electronic health and care records which make it easier to share information so that people have to tell their story just once. It is updated as needs change and there are personal health and care budgets for at least 3 million people. By 2020, we will have made large-scale progress in ensuring that other public services neighbourhoods and communities are sensitive to the needs of disabled people of all ages, <clears throat> where, where there is one hand intolerance of disability hate crime and on the other awareness and a supportive environment in local communities. There is a doubling of the number of people with dementia friends and there will be an increasing number of businesses which are adopting policies encouraging employment of disabled people and flexible schemes to assist carers. By 2020 we would have a care workforce which has parity of esteem with the health workforce, with turnover rates as low as 10%, not at 25 and 32%. Here are just some thoughts about what we can aspire to. But it is clear that from a national framework of solid investment and commitment to health and care, these things have to be built by local arrangements by local partners working with users, carers and communities right across the system. I think it was Joel Klein who said, you cannot mandate greatness, you have to unleash it. Unleash it. So I hope that this conference will be part of that journey of unleashing it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, at the end of, of the next speaker, we, we, might have, we, we thought we'd have time to have a few question and answer sessions. Just a quick one. So, um, I'd like to introduce Giles Wil Wilmore now, who's Director of Patient and Information Directorate and, at NHS England. Welcome, Giles. Thank you. And he's going to talk on integrated personal commissioning. Well, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. And I'll address my first comment to the chairs. Does that count as two? Um, uh, I, I do feel a bit stitched up, I have to say, coming to a, as an NHS person to a, a social care and, and uh, local government conference to find out they're in a great sporting cauldron like this. There was going to be a competition, and uh, then Sam gave me the wrong code for the Wi-Fi, so I couldn't get on the internet to quickly research all the fences around the course. So the only ones I know, plus many more, David has already mentioned. So um, I counted at six at least, David, so that was, uh, that was a brilliant uh, effort. So eight, was it? Eight. So uh, Clinton, I, I think I'm going to fall at the first fence here, and... Uh, 
whatever its name is, um, and, and have to withdraw from the competition. Although, um, I do want to check whether you can all hear me okay. Is the microphone picking up at the back? Because, uh, as you may have noticed, I'm very tall. I, I believe only two inches shorter than Beecher's Brook, which is the, the tallest fence on the course. So I, I often have to stoop at microphones. Anyway, enough of the light-hearted banter, much as it's entertaining. So, um, why am I here? Who am I? What's my involvement in this agenda? So just a few words of context. So I work for NHS England. My role there is Director for Patient and Public Voice. So I have many exciting uh, kind of responsibilities in my portfolio, which are all around really ensuring that the NHS is much better at hearing the voice of citizens, patients, service users, members of the public, members of local communities. Not only in shaping how the NHS should be more responsive to their needs and NHS England as the organisation that sits in charge if you like of billions of pounds worth of public money that's commissioning NHS services should be more responsive and accountable to the needs of uh, people who use those services. In the particular remit of personalisation, I also have a responsibility of working with our clinical colleagues, Martin McShane as the National Director for Long-Term Conditions, around how we can try and make the NHS much more person-centred, much more responsive to the needs of the whole person as an individual and their care across all aspects of their life, not just their medical treatment. And uh, for me, this journey, I have to say, is, is relatively recent. Um, my career is, is, is as a civil servant in the Department of Health where I've um, led on a range of kind of work largely to do with the NHS side of health and care. And uh, after the last election, I was, I was asked to lead the development of an information strategy for the government, uh, the power of information across health and social care. And it had all sorts of fascinating topics in, like information governance that's already been mentioned, and the importance of connecting IT systems, and how you cl code clinical data, and so on. And uh, important though those things are, the thing that really gripped me in that work was the power of information to transform people's lives, and David's already alluded to this, the power of information and support and advocacy uh, to really put people in control of their own health and care and their own well-being, and the need to do this in a bottom-up way that built on the assets in our communities and built on the support people can get from outside of statutory services, particularly the NHS. And, so when the opportunity came in 2012 uh, to find out that I was at risk of redundancy and had to find another job somewhere else in the system, I was delighted to uh, apply for the job that I have now in NHS England, really taking this agenda forward. And so I'm going to say a little bit about the work we are doing in NHS England around this personalisation agenda and how it links with the work of TLAP and LGA, ADAS, etc. Um, but I will say at the outset, we're at the foothills in the NHS. We've got lots to learn from social care. I'm that most dangerous of species, really. I'm a passionate enthusiast, but with relatively little knowledge and experience. So I hope you'll bear with me on this journey and uh, recognise my commitment to work together with you. Where do I need to point this to make it work? Hey, so what I'm going to try and cover in the, uh, in the presentation is a little bit of the context that we face in the NHS, and you'll know this already, so I won't dwell on that for very long. A little bit about the five-year forward view, which again, David has already mentioned. Why we think the evidence for empowering people around personalization and self-care is compelling. And then a little bit about integrated personal commissioning, which David has already mentioned as well. And I won't say a lot about that, because there's a, a workshop on that later on, which I hope many of you will be able to join. And then talk about how we want to work in partnership, really, and what we, we feel in the NHS we can learn from your experiences in social care. Okay, so this is the uh, famous 30 billion health spending gap that uh, David's already referred to. And it's one of three challenges that I think the NHS faces uh, on quite a significant strategic scale. So the money, the rise of multiple chronic conditions, and what uh, I'll refer to as the moral challenge, which I'll come on to. And what you can see on the graph is this 30 billion pound gap emerging, and the bottom purple line is the projected resource. And of course, the NHS is about the only area of the public sector where spending has not been cut in real terms. It's a flat terms, uh, you know, inflation-linked 
kind of growth effectively, which means that although the graph rises uh, steadily, the demand over the next five to ten years rises even more significantly. So this gap will start to emerge for real, and this has been recognised as a hugely significant issue and has led to much of the thinking that's uh, gone into the five-year forward view. Um, and, and this graph really just highlights the growing number of people with one or more long-term conditions. So we're at about 15 million people now with one or more long-term condition in England. Uh, the biggest growth is in comorbidity or multiple long-term conditions. So you can see at the right-hand side of the graph by 2016, the purple and yellow shaded areas are people with two or more long-term conditions. So as a proportion of the overall population of people with long-term conditions, they're growing. Uh, so they're going to be people that have the highest dependency needs. And combining that with a, an aging population, it's fairly easy to see that that creates all sorts of pressures on the NHS, not just financial although this group of people will uh, continue to consume ever-increasing amounts of the NHS budget, about 70% at the moment, but it also puts huge pressure on the NHS because the way it's structured and the way services are set up and the way institutions are organised are not geared up for the kind of care that we're going to be talking about today. And what's the moral challenge? Well, I think on the day that uh, the report authored by Stephen Bubb has been published around the uh, tragic events following uh, Winterbourne View and what we may be able to do about that, then the evidence here is equally uh, compelling and morally uh, kind of powerful in terms of uh, the confidential inquiry into premature deaths of people with learning disabilities. So, 37% of the deaths of people with learning disabilities were avoidable. Um, it's a, a shocking statistic. It's something that morally absolutely has to be addressed, and I think this is just one example of the arguments becoming more and more compelling for personalisation and person-centred care and starting with the needs of the individual as defined by the individual, not defined by what the service happens to be able to offer. Uh, absolutely something that we have to act on. And the five-year forward view, um, what I will say about it is it's very important, I think, for two or three reasons. This, this quote is, is just really setting the context, really, and so I won't uh, read it all out for you. But I think from an NHS perspective, it's important because it's a statement by system leaders across the NHS. So Simon Stevens, the chief exec of NHS England, has obviously personally driven uh, this uh, vision very strongly, and that's, and that's great for us that we have uh, a chief exec who's impassioned about this area, but it's not solely NHS England. Six of the main arm's length bodies, national NHS organisations, came together to support this five-year forward view. It's a non-political thing. It's a statement by leaders in the NHS about how the NHS needs to grow and change and develop to meet the challenges that I've just been outlining. But it's also a vision that politicians of all colours do share. There's an emerging consensus, I think, politically, that the challenges that the NHS faces cannot be met uh, without serious, not only reform to the way we offer services, but really switching things round to start with the needs of the individual person, their care, their support, their health and well-being, and to make sure that the services match those needs rather than trying to cram people into the services that happen to be available. And the integrated personal commissioning program that David's mentioned also a little bit about later is, is an example of how we're trying to work jointly with uh, social care and local government to, to start to make a reality of that vision. But the five-year forward view is, is more than just personalisation. It recognises that the assets that we have in our communities are a key factor in supporting people to live healthily and independently for as long as possible. So care, as has already been mentioned a great deal by David, six million people caring informally uh, across the country. It's a huge, uh, a huge resource that we don't make best use of in terms of support to carers or indeed how carers can support um, you know, people with, with care needs to take the uh, pressure off statutory services, but also to improve the quality of life of the people they care for. Um, we're also um, you know, fortunate to have about three million volunteers across health and social care, as many as there are paid members of staff. Again, a huge potential resource, and many hospitals have waiting lists for people wanting to volunteer. So there's a huge amount of public empathy and support and goodwill to be tapped into there. 
uh, an average 1,500 um, health and care voluntary community sector organisations in each local authority area. Um, they're there, they're doing great work. The NHS, I, I have to say, is not always as good as it could be at tapping into that resource and supporting those organisations to support people uh, in the community. So there's a huge potential that this document recognises to do much better at this. And I'm not going to stand here and say for a minute that because we've published a high-level vision statement, everything's rosy in the garden. Absolutely not. There's a huge amount still to do. But what I would say is something like the five-year forward view is necessary but not sufficient. Unless we have a vision that people in the NHS can align behind that joins us closely in a shared agenda with local government social care and indeed public health, um, then I don't think we can make a start on this work the vision isn't enough on its own, but it is an important step forward, I think, in showing the seriousness of the intent that the NHS has. So just a little bit about the, the evidence base that we're pulling together in the NHS. And this is about a piece of work called patient activation. And um, this was uh, subject to a workshop at the Future of Healthcare conference last week. Um, in London and uh, what came out of it is that people hate the term patient and they hate the term activation and uh, that's understandable. Um, just to explain why that term is used, this is an American researched uh, piece of work and the term is trademarked and that's what it happens to be called but uh, I quite agree the concept of activation reminds me of one of those kind of uh, scenes at the end of a James Bond film where the, uh, the secret bunker of high tech uh, wizardry is just about to explode and uh, somebody says activate you know, turbo boost number three and a button is pressed and all the machinery starts to move and, and it has that connotation of being very passive and people waiting to receive some kind of benevolent activation. And so please don't get hung up on the language but what's important about this concept of patient activation is the strap line at the bottom, confidence, skills and knowledge. So the piece of work that we are now uh, working with five uh, clinical commissioning groups to pilot across uh, you know, a large number of, kind of patients in those areas is how do we support people to have the confidence, skills and knowledge to understand their conditions, to manage their conditions more effectively themselves, to understand where they can get information, to have the confidence to challenge clinical views if it doesn't feel right for them in their lives and their care and to have a better kind of long-term plan geared around their own goals and their own outcomes. So it's, I think, a really important work, piece of work and the evidence from the US, not surprisingly, has shown that when people receive this kind of uh, support, their knowledge, skills and confidence grow. They become much more empowered in their own health and care. Their demands on statutory health services reduce and their quality of life and life outcomes uh, increase. So none of that's rocket science for this audience, I know that, but one of the challenges we have in the NHS, but I believe it's also an opportunity, is to be better at presenting the evidence to the people making the decisions locally. So if you think about the reforms that have taken place in the NHS, the vast amount of money now routes through clinical commissioning groups. They're led by GPs, clinical commissioners, who are going to be interested in the evidence base, they're going to be interested in the outcomes, they're going to be interested in the arguments that this will deliver results that improve the quality of patient care and improve life outcomes for people. And then you've got commissioning managers, finance directors and others who are struggling with how do we pay for a new type of service where we're still investing all this money into the services that we have. So we have to be able to make the arguments much more strongly that there is both a moral argument in terms of improving people's health and well-being, a clinical argument in terms of improving people's outcomes, and a financial argument in terms of the cost effectiveness and sustainability of the NHS. If we can make those three arguments together, then we have a really powerful case for change that I believe will start to win over uh, those people around the country making the day-to-day -day commissioning decisions around how we structure and invest in our services. And so one of the things NHS England is doing tomorrow, we will be launching a piece of work realising the value 
um, which is based on Chapter 2 of the uh, Five Year Four Review around how we bring together some of the evidence, how we do research into the levers and blockers in the NHS that are getting in the way of this kind of reform. That's not a, a policy document or a vision, it's an invitation to, uh, to tender, if you like, from organisations to help us bring this evidence base together to do the further research, to look at the levers and incentives we need to put in place to start to make this a reality in the NHS uh, much more systematically. As ever, we've got great examples of good practice, we've got great innovators that we can name from all parts of the country, but as ever, not everybody's doing this and that's the challenge. So, that's a piece of work, as I say, we will be commissioning uh, in line with our own values and the Social Value Act. We're inviting organisations from the charitable and not-for-profit sector to front up those bids to make sure it's grounded in uh, organisations that have uh, community interests at their heart. So we're not going out to, uh, to the big consultancies as such. We're seeing this as a piece of work that's grounded in the reality of personalisation programmes that are happening uh, throughout the country and trying to help them strengthen the evidence base and make more compelling arguments to NHS commissioners about why this personalisation agenda is something not only that they can do, but the arguments for doing it are indeed compelling. Um, so just some of the kinds of things that we're trying to focus on that sit underneath this. Well, personal health budgets, of course, you guys know all about personal budgets and we're again uh, relative newcomers to this area, but personal health budgets are uh, having uh, a significant impact on the lives of people that are using them. Still, obviously, far too few people. We would like to see that expand and grow as a movement and we would like to see it linked very closely with personal care budgets so ultimately we just have personal budgets and that's what the integrated personal commissioning program is, is all about. Um, shared decision making, again David referred to the importance not only of information but advocacy and support to really help people make fully informed decisions and choices. And I think in the NHS, the debate about choice is far too often centred around choice of provider. Would you like to be referred here or there? That's an important choice. It matters to people. But I would argue for many people, particularly people with long-term conditions, it probably matters less than the choice about what their care plan looks like, the choice and decisions they make about how they want to live their lives, how they want to interact with services and what kinds of care and support they need. So we've got to expand the concept of choice to be really choice in a much more holistic sense. And self-management support, programs such as expert patients, patient leadership, supporting people with the knowledge, skills and confidence to be better equipped to manage their own uh, conditions and health issues as successfully as they can. Um, integrated personal budgets and the integrated personal commissioning program, as I say, there's a separate workshop on that this afternoon, which I hope people are able to join. And I, I guess I'm very much preaching to the converted about this, so I'm not going to say a lot about this other than to emphasize the points that have already been made. For us, it's really about integration. You cannot define health in isolation from care. Personal health budgets have to link with personal care budgets, so ultimately we're talking about supporting people to manage their own care and take control of their own decisions through, where appropriate, the management of the budget that they use to commission their own care. Um, integrated personal commissioning, uh, jointly launched with TLAP, ADAS and the Local Government Association. Um, again, a workshop on this, but briefly, the uh, aim of the programme is largely twofold. One, to embed person-centred care and care planning and person-centred approaches across populations and for defined groups of people who would benefit. There is no logical limit to the number of people who could benefit from integrated personalised commissioning, but the uh, specification that we've issued invites expressions of interest to be pilot sites around four cohort, uh, if you like, populations in particular. And so that's people with learning disabilities, children with complex care care and support needs, people with ongoing enduring mental health conditions and people with multiple conditions, particularly older people in need of ongoing uh, care and support. And as I say, those four categories are not meant to be exclusive in any way, but what we were trying to do was certainly on the health side, think how do we take the concept of personalised health budgets further? What are the next logical areas you would extend this movement to from people currently a very small defined group as people having been assessed with continuing health care needs who are eligible for a personal health budget. 
and the financial model are really important, working jointly between NHS and uh, local government commissioners to identify how budgets can be linked and pooled and ring-fenced around the individual. So there's quite a lot of technical work in that. How do you hypothecate and identify the amount of money that health and care commissioners have got to spend on, on an individual, you know, dependent on their particular care and support needs? But I think it's important that we start to look at this Certainly in the NHS, the tariff based around particular conditions and treatments has been a disincentive to this kind of integrated work. So concepts like a year of care tariff where we you know, pay money for a whole year of treatment for an individual and looking at their outcomes in a much more holistic sense has got to be the way we start to think about rewarding commissioners and uh, providers in, in, in this context. And how are we working in partnership to do this? Well, on, uh, on Friday, we launched the Coalition for Collaborative Care. I say we, this wasn't an NHS England thing. NHS England is a partner and supporter of the coalition. Uh, Martin Rowledge and Catherine Wilton and colleagues are here today and we'll be running a workshop later this morning on the coalition, so I hope many of you are able to join that. And in a way, the, well, not in a way, but just being very frank, the coalition and the idea behind it was very much inspired by TLAP. What we realized in health that we needed was a collaboration across a range of partners to promote the importance of partnership working around the um, personalization agenda so the coalition is very much modeled around TLAP's experience of trying to build that network build that partnership so it's not an organization it doesn't have a statutory basis it's a network of of, of like-minded individuals and organisations. It includes national bodies like NHS England, like Public Health England, etc. It also includes a range of charity and voluntary sector organisations and indeed clinical bodies such as the Royal College of GPs, the Royal College of Nursing and so on. So it's very much there to try and mirror what TLAP is doing in the social care world and I hope bring together one minute, I've got one more slide, I think, sorry, and bring together health and social care as a much more broad and extended network around uh, personalisation. And finally, what can we learn from social care? Well, you guys led the way on personalisation. There's a lot of experience you've got about the trials and tribulations of this journey that we need to work from, learn from, but the key things are value of co-production, how do we work in partnership with patients and service users as well as other agencies, how do we make the most of the assets we have in our communities and particularly strengthen working relationships with the voluntary sector and how do we shift to talking about not what's the matter with you but what matters to you. So we've got a long way to go but it's an exciting journey and I hope my being here today and engaging the debate with you reassures you that the NHS, although late to the table, is indeed serious about this agenda now and determined to make progress. So thank you very much for the invitation today. Thank you very much, Giles. Unfortunately, we've sort of run out of time. So what I suggest everyone, if anyone's got any questions for, for Giles or David, either catch them in the, during refreshment break or at one of the workshops later. And uh, now we're going to break until 12 o'clock. And if you want to come into workshop one, that's introducing the Coalition for Co Collaborative Care. It's here. And Making It Real for Mental Health is in the Papillion Suite. And the Papillion Suite is above. And the Personalization of the Care Act is the Corbier, uh, which is above and making it real for everyone is in the lower saddle room bar and that's downstairs on level two. Okay, enjoy the, enjoy the break, thank you.